Hello, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. Thanks for being on time for this week's Water Talk. Uh, today, we'll be looking at um, some tips and tricks and what has happened in the last year with InfoWorks ICM, what you might have uh, missed, but uh, important tools that you might want to be updated on. And uh, yeah, we're happy to have you all here. We'll wait just a couple minutes while we go through uh, the safe harbor statement. Again, most everything we'll be presenting in this webinar. Uh, we'll be looking back at updates, tips and tricks, how to use ICM. But if we do make any forward looking statements, know that that's not a guarantee and don't uh, run off and buy some tokens or buy the software based off of any forward statements we may make in this webinar here today. Uh, my name is Tim Adiris. I've been with Innovize for uh, six years doing techno sales support, pre and post sales support. Uh, happy to be joined this week by Ryan Brown, who uh, will be doing most of the uh, ICM, leading most of the ICM discussion. Ryan? Yep. Uh oh, should I introduce myself? Uh, <laughs> in the same role as Tim here, just uh, uh, been here for about three and a half years doing uh, tech sales uh, and sports stuff. Um, yeah, we go to the next one. Mm -hmm. And the goal for this, uh, our Water Talks webinars, is to create a community. Please do add your questions in here. We'll try to get to those. We definitely try to prioritize those as we're going through. Uh, again, some of this ICM content will be paying close attention to that Q&A, but you should. Um, and maybe our team, marketing team, got rid of the chat function, but you should have access to both, but we're only going to be really monitoring the uh, Q&A there for you all. Uh, and you might notice that we don't have any upcoming ones. We usually display the upcoming water talks on here. Um, and there's a good reason for that. You want to? Yeah, so there, uh, you know, the TBD, uh, what water talk will be next uh, in March here, but we are happy to announce uh, upcoming, what we're calling right now water drops, which is uh, based on some results from our survey in our last water talk uh, a couple of months ago in December. So in that survey, we asked you all a question, community here, you know, what would you prefer more of? And, and the biggest thing we saw was quick step-by-step -step workflows and how-tos for modelers. Uh, and then still some of the, the water modeling discussion. So uh, what you're gonna see from us, and again, we'll try to be as effective as we have been with Water Talks and, and getting this link out so you all can register, is we're gonna start a kind of separate kind of YouTube channel where we're gonna be publishing five to 15 minute kind of tailored workflows that really focus on some of those step-by-step -step workflows that are not uh, exactly learning content, how to learn, you know, Inforks ICM or InfoWater Pro or any of our other solutions from the ground up, but really focused on um, issues that, that we're hearing folks out there have and, and how we can be a little bit more innovative with the software and again, the tools you have. So uh, some examples there you see in the bullets, but again, we are more than happy to hear your suggestions. Again, this is a community. Uh, you're definitely a part of this and we uh, want to cater to you and, and get those answers to you that you find most interesting. So uh, I think these shorter workflows will be a little bit easier uh, to, again, sit down and gain value from than these webinars uh, for, for a lot of folks out there. So we're excited to um, just kind of create this little shorter form of content for you all to access and, and view um, at your leisure there. And, yeah, and I think there's a poll at the end, too, with the same question and uh, I think a, a place to be able to provide suggestions if uh, you have any on your mind right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely in the peak. survey at the end. The survey at the end, we, we always ask for topics and suggestions. Feel free to write those in uh, if you have uh, anything there. But yeah, a sneak peek in terms of what one of these first little videos we've been working on. Uh, and maybe this is more for uh, the, the water distribution folks. I mean, we probably have a lot of uh, gravity modeling uh, folks on this call here for ICM. But if you do work in InfoWater Pro at all or distribution modeling, uh, this is some of uh, what you might see here, how you could start to set up your unidirectional flushing sequences in a dashboard uh, to really take uh, away from some of those binders and paper workflows from the field crews there. So looking forward to kind of bringing more of these quick workflows uh, to, again, this community um, that we're very appreciative for. All right. And with that, 
um yeah go for it ryan for yeah so uh, yeah when we first kind of started putting this together i figured this would be a good time since it has been uh just a little over a year we did we did a what's new in infoworks icm uh, i think november 2021 so uh there's been a couple of releases since then and just some enhancements that have been added over the the course of the year um clearly i forgot our animation there um Global launch was uh, probably the biggest thing in the 2023 uh, version release. Um, this uh, number on the release too uh, kind of skips a year. Uh, I think the previous release was 2021.8 or 9. Um, this was just to align more with Autodesk's style of how they release and how they version things out. Um, but it does, uh, just like any kind of AutoCAD license, have a little sign in uh, up the top of the right corner uh, with this little box in. Just an example of uh, mine is there. Um, the other thing that was added that I thought was significant was terrain sensitive meshing for 2D zones. Uh, I was a little surprised that this wasn't in here initially because it uses the same 2D engine as the ICM networks. Um, so just adding that in. Um, just increases the the amount of productivity uh, for those things because terrain sensitive meshing is, is one of my favorite things. Um, in 2023.1, uh, this was out in July, uh, a big ask that we've had from users was being able to open up previous database versions. This doesn't go, um, you know, back to, you know, previous versions, but everything from 2023 uh, point zero, um, and then we get up to I think 2023.3 is the last release. Um, you can open up older versions of the databases, older versions of databases, and newer versions of the software. Create transportable databases with specific versions. Create master databases with specific versions. Um, just a little bit easier um, instead of having to uh, constantly update uh, a version whenever you're working uh, between different teams. Um, so here's an example of that, just being able to display. Uh, this is creating a, another transportable database, and you can see the drop-down menu uh, on the right here, uh, just different options for uh, which database you want to uh, make the transportable database for. Uh, new culvert type in 2023.1. Uh, so uh, if you're familiar with being uh, with putting in culverts into Infoworks ICM, uh, you might recall that you have to have an, a culvert in, a culvert out, and then the actual uh, culvert uh, piece in the middle. Uh, we've included culvert as a type of conduit. So if you're laying down a link, uh, it's just a, a different kind of conduit type, the culvert, and it just combines those three different objects into one singular uh, piece rather than having to make that culvert inlet, culvert, culvert outlet. Uh, the other thing that was added uh, along with this was culvert codes based on the FHWA standards, and it automatically populates different head loss fields. Uh, so uh, if you're familiar with the FHWA standards, you should look, uh, this should look fairly familiar to you, uh, just populating these uh, KMCY uh, uh, values in it uh, instead of having to necessarily manually put that stuff in. Again, just making it easier to be able to model these systems. Uh, limit runoff for an object, uh, for an object, uh, a subcatchment trains to. Um, so this is uh, basically the effort here uh, is to be able to uh, have a capacity on, let's say, a downspout. Uh, so if there's, you know, only so much water can get down off of a roof through the downspout, you can actually limit the amount of water uh, that gets onto the mesh. And so then there's two ways that it can be um, captured. It can either just be lost from the system or discharged to a, the 2D mesh. Um, um, so if, yeah, if it spills out of the gutter, um, then it can spill out onto the 2D mesh versus just being lost from the system. Uh, some enhancements for the uh, NOAA rainfall generator. Uh, this was an update uh, that we put in. Uh, I remember going over it uh, last year when we did this thing, uh, but we have added some new temporal distributions, the Huff distribution, Bullet 1075, and the alternating block, uh, along with the NOAA Atlas 14 and the NRCS regional uh, that were in there previously. Mesh level zone enhancements. Uh, so this is... Uh, change to the mesh level zones object, uh, adding in a, a couple of different 
um, things in here uh, to be able to, um, yeah, just the type here. So we've got the level now, so specifying just the fixed level. Um, and then you can also uh, set things relative to the uh, opening. I'm going to close out my uh, floating panel. Sorry. Um, so the mesh level, uh, the level is just to set the mesh level zone to the specific elevation. The relative the highest is the mesh level zone is set to the highest elevation within that mesh level. And then the relative lowest uh, mesh level is set to the lowest elevation of the mesh uh, element. And then also raise or lower, uh, where every vertex of the mesh level zone is either raised or lowered by a specific value. Um, 4K resolution support. Um, this was kind of subtle, but um, I, I know I had to run into issues with it. Uh, if you've ever, um, I guess, updated things uh, and or loaded this onto like a new computer and you have multiple monitors, uh, sometimes you'd get these very, very tiny icons um, and things would kind of be squished up. Um, now that's been uh, resolved and being able to, uh, and the whole issue behind that was just because it was a four, they were 4K screens, uh, but now that is supported, so that shouldn't happen anymore. Um, 2023.2, this was October. I guess this was the last one that that come out has come out, um, 2023.2. Um, no need to correct roughness zones. So this was uh, whenever you had overlapping roughness zones in the the mesh, you wouldn't be able to um, mesh it. Uh, now you can assign the priority. So the number one priority is over a number two priority uh, type of idea. So if you have mesh zones, um, you're not having to go through and um, clean things up like you, you normally would in the past. Man, I really needed to do my um, animations there. Anyway, um, new runoff method for uh, volume in the ICM networks, uh, the uh, curve number. So the curve number has always been in there. Um, but it was uh, similar. So it's similar to the, the curve number swim method is similar to the SCS method for uh, volume and runoff, but intended to be for multiple storms versus the just straight curve number, uh, more for just those design storms in those um, typical periods. Um, easier to update cross sections. Uh, so being able to update the uh, line elevation from the ground model. Uh, previously, you had to uh, go through a couple of steps and um, modify some things, but now you have this button to update from ground model directly within the cross-section dialog. Um, so instead of having to go up to, I think it was in model um, and, and having to go through all that uh, a little bit quicker. Uh, new routing models for, um, uh, for SWIM networks. Um, so uh, SWIM was always in there as a, a routing method for uh, for storm events, uh, but we've added in the SES curvilinear and the SES triangular um, in there as well. Uh, and then this is a little bit of a, a sneak peek per se. So uh, this is integration with Civil 3D. Uh, this has more to do with Civil 3D and technically this is out, except it is uh, only ac acceptable um, or accessible by uh, some DLL files. So you have to have some kind of special DLL files in there. Um, so you can see I'm, I'm making some commands here on the bottom, loading the DLL file. Uh, you do have to have the most recent version of Civil 3D, uh, but now you have the capability of the ICM config, ICM import, and ICM export. So config, as it uh, would imply, is uh, just matching it up what it is in the Civil 3D pipe network to what it is in the ICM network over on the right here for uh, various types of structures you have going on. Um, so ICM in export is uh, the next step here. Uh, once you get all that stuff mapped, uh, mapping where you want it to go to. If you have any curved pipes uh, in here, uh, just figuring out the method that you'd want to um, transfer that information into. If you want to kind of break up the pipe and um, have it represented curved uh, just as it's kind of broken out. Uh, but then it pushes out a CSV file uh, and then you would just go to um, network and uh, update the model from that CSV. Um, and then we hit cancel there, gives you a series of different warnings. Those were just because the uh, pipe 
name in the civil 3d network was too much uh, for the user text fields uh, that got populated there uh, but as you can see in this example just kind of moving some stuff around um, changing attributes different things like that uh, you can go up and export this to a, a csv file um, pretty standard just kind of using the default uh, things here and so i'll just wait for it to kind of complete so we switch back over to civil 3d we've got that same network in here uh, and then go to ICM import, find that CSV file and import the network. Um, it'll update the current network if it recognizes that it's the same one. Uh, and it just kind of goes through, you can kind of see some of the manholes blinking. It's, it's really just going through, um, case by case and, and modifying those things. Uh, so you can see, I've got this, this manhole now is modified. This one's been modified to where I, uh, move those uh, two different objects in there. Uh, so uh, on to modeling best practices in ICM. Um, so I guess just kind of through the time I've been here, uh, it's become clear that uh, ICM, there, there's some subtle things about ICM that um, need to be taken into um, account um, that it might not be um, obvious to every person but just uh, looking at some of the hydrology options uh, within stormwater you need three components and these are all accessible through the subcatchment window of course you need subcatchments um, and, but you also need land use and then runoff surface um, the other part of the subcatchment would be the um, would be the time of uh, the um, methodology for the routing uh, but basically what we have here whoops and it, uh, I thought I had some animations here but the idea here is that you would um, look at the subcatchment over on the left here you have some land use ID ID you would open up the land use ID uh, and then you would define the different runoff surfaces and so this is where you would come up with a different um, routing model as well as the volumetric losses uh, through there and then the routing method, of course, through the um, actual catchment. Um, hydrology options for uh, I and I. Uh, so, of course, we've got the RTK uh, methodology in there uh, that is uh, accessible again through the um, through the um, subcatchment uh, window. So, up the top here is uh, just a little screenshot of the subcatchment information, and that's where you specify what RTK hydrograph you want to use, and then you can go um, into those tables and modify those values as well. Uh, there's also a ground infiltration methodology, too, uh, really just trying to do the same thing. It just does it a little bit differently. Um, if you've been on these for a long time, you might remember we had uh, DeKalb County uh, on here with uh, some of their consultants and uh, used this uh, ground infiltration model uh, and found it particularly useful just because uh, they do have a variable uh, groundwater store or groundwater table. And uh, as that changes uh, seasonally, uh, they're able to better capture the INI happening in their system. Uh, so hydrology, uh, this uh, also seems to be a little bit of a confusing point. So just describing how exactly all these numbers come together. So we do have the subcatchment properties where you specify the rainfall profile. That rainfall profile is related to um, the storm event, the, the name of the storm event that you're using in the simulation run. Um, so you can see these are both two, which means this subcatchment is going to use this rainfall information. Uh, you can modify the uh, titles here. Uh, by going to uh, by right clicking on the column uh, and then uh, going to profile properties uh, you can see the profile title popping up right there uh, so if you wanted to change it to something that's a little more descriptive than you know just one or two or whatever um, just go in there and, and modify that and just make sure it's uh, kind of all lined up between those different things and then again this is the storm event uh, that's being used in that simulation so um, that that storm event needs to match up with the uh, uh, the the names in the subcatchments that you're using. Uh, dry weather flow. Uh, so this is another one where there's just a few steps involved in terms of being able to put these uh, together. 
Um, so in the subcatchment properties, we have the dry weather flow category uh, with a profile here one. Uh, this is related to the uh, name of the profile in the actual dry weather flow uh, database object. Um, so um, and and the, the, this is both a picture of the uh, well these two ones on the right are pictures of the dry weather flow database object. Uh, the uh, first one in the middle there is the common tab, and then we've got the profile tab, uh, and you can swap between those two at the bottom of the uh, dialog there. Um, so the one you have selected here is going to be the profile um, of, of the same nature uh, once you swip that, switch that tab. And what essentially happens is the population data uh, is taken, and it's multiplied against the per capita flow per day. Uh, of the profile that you're working on, uh, and then the uh, factor uh, during that time period. So the population gets multiplied against per capita flow per day, and that gets multiplied against the factor uh, during that time step, and that's what gives you the flow during that time step. Uh, so just having each one of those components and again, matching, making sure that things are matching up uh, population, whoops, one more thing, uh, population uh, would generally be the thing uh, you would kind of tweak in order to calibrate the model. Uh, this is different than the swim networks too, where it only takes into account the factor and the, uh, the flow per day. It doesn't have a population aspect to it. Uh, so normally uh, people might be used to modifying this per capita or the flow per day. Uh, instead of mo modifying something like the population um, in this case. So, Tim, you popped it back on. you want to say something? Yeah, well, uh, just on this topic, we, we talked about this a bit in December, too, about how, say, you're, you're doing a sanitary analysis, capacity analysis, and you want it based on kind of land use and, and, and do it that way instead of by population. You could basically set your population value in ICM equal to the area of that particular subcatchment, or maybe you have your subcatchments linked as parcels, and that way you can do it based on kind of the area of your your, your parcels or your subcatchments and instead of population, if you'd like to do it that way. So one comment on that, and then we did have a question um, yeah. come in. Uh, actually, a couple of questions. One, um, if, if you do have questions about ICM Viewer, uh, feel free to email us. Our emails will be here at the end, or um, uh, email your your local account manager for information on ICM viewer licensing. We had that question come in, and then question from Ricardo uh, that you, know, you mentioned this kind of at the beginning, Ryan. The database backward compatibility, but for that database backward compatibility is the yeah. software only able to open earlier 2023.x versions or all previous versions? Um, no, it just goes back to 2023, and I mean. It, it's one of those things we can't really go back and fix, you know, the old code and stuff like that. Um, but you got to start somewhere. I mean, it's like I said, something that's been kind of a pain point for people uh, that they hate having to like, I'll send stuff out to people. And I'm always usually on the the latest version, whereas clients are, you know, maybe a few versions back and it would just kind of get frustrated that they couldn't open up what I was trying to help them with. Um so, yeah, it's only 2023 versions and going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. That was it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just to kind of follow up on this and, and what Tim was talking about, I mean, really, it comes down to not, not necessarily the names that are used here, but just the functionality of how these things come together to get that flow. And so, um, again, just thinking about population doesn't necessarily have to be population. It can be something else. Um, yeah, okay, so troubleshooting uh, within, um, or, or I guess best practices within um, 1D. So um, generally, uh, steep pipes are going to cause issues. Um, so this is actually something that you can pick up through the engineering validation where you can set uh, various, um, various slopes and be able to um, specify that you don't want to have uh, very, and, and these can cause like very random um, types of um, issues and, and be very unclear. Um, usually uh, when the gradient is greater than uh, 10%, uh, you can run into issues. Um, 
Another thing in here is within, uh, if you are modeling rivers in 1D, uh, you might have noticed or not noticed this conveyance data uh, thing in here. Uh, so if you open up this table and look at it, um, there's not a whole lot you can change with it, but this is basically uh, looking at how much flow is going based on the depth um, in this cross section. So this can get a, give a good idea of, um, of um, issues. So a lot of times you'll have a, a conveyance that will, um, as it changes, like different roughnesses and things like that, um, you can get some jagged uh, conveyances and uh, versus depth, meaning that the higher the depth goes, the lower the flow goes. Of course, that's um, kind of illogical. Uh, this website down here at the bottom is behind our uh, support portal, but it does uh, give some information on the purpose of the uh, river section panel markers. Um, so within the river section uh, or within the cross section data, you can actually change the or, or set the um, the section panel markers, and that can help with some of these, these conveyance issues of um, wherever you have those um, kind of pullbacks in the conveyance versus depth. Uh, setting a panel marker there uh, can generally help smooth things out a little bit. Oh, and the other thing is with the um, panel markers, you can pull up um, various uh, conveyance data and plot them all in each other. Generally want to have conveyance uh, that are fairly similar uh, through a different reach. If you're getting um, conveyance curves where they're drastically different from each other, uh, that can also uh, point to some issues that, that are going on. Uh, uh, some more 1D hydraulics, the bank lines being lower than the fall weg. So we can see over on the right side here, uh, the ground elevation and the bank lines are, uh, of course, much uh, lower than than the uh, the fall weg or the lowest point in the river. That, of course, is um, uh, kind of ira uh, irrational and, and illogical, too. Um, regulation irregularities between the outfall and the bed elevations. Um, this is a little bit difficult to look at, but basically the idea here is that this outlet is um, discharging below the uh, bottom of this river, which uh, obviously doesn't make sense. Likewise, if you're trying to discharge um, above the banks or something like that, that can cause issues as well. Uh, some things to think about with uh, 2D um, hydraulics. Um, sometimes you might need a 2D initial conditions. Um, a lot of the times, though, uh, through the initialization process of uh, Inforx ICM, when it starts a run, usually it's, it, it finds a, a stable point. So even if you do have like a wall of water, um, usually the um, in, in initialization um, are um, better um and you won't necessarily need need that uh that 2d um initial condition um the other thing is uh sometimes with the banks if you're doing uh 1d uh mixed with 2d uh often the river reach break lines are created from survey data uh, the 2D uh, uh, mesh is often generated with ground models from aerial LIDAR or other uh, less um, discretized, I guess, uh, sources. Um, so typically there's going to be a mis mismatch between the two. And, and because of that, uh, we have these options in here to either lower the 2D mesh elements um, to the adjacent bank levels um, and then also the same uh, capability um, within the 2D parameters. Just two ways of doing the same thing. Um, 1D structures in 2D. Uh, so this is another where uh, you might have um, outfalls. Uh, I know uh, I would always run into issues where I would have some survey information with my conduits. And so I would have inverts and um, inverts uh, for the upstream and downstream ends. And they wouldn't necessarily line up to uh, what they are uh, on the mesh. And, and that goes back to, again, the same kind of thing where the pipes are surveyed. And then I'm getting a ground model from uh, aerial uh, LIDAR. 
Uh, and in order to fix this, uh, a good practice would just be to use a mesh level zone, uh, kind of surround it, uh, try to get it about the same size as the triangular, all, all the other triangular meshes that you have going on in there uh, for all the other triangular elements. Um, but this would just make it make it so that you can set those elevations um, to a specific level and make sure that uh, wherever the um, wherever the pipe is actually coming out um, isn't above or below the ground. Yeah, so just making sure that the inverts are matching up between those two. Um, oh, um, the other thing with 1D structures in 2D, uh, you could certainly uh, model one-dimensional conduits and culverts and bridges uh, within the 1D uh, space. Um, however, this can cause some issues um, just with the way of, if you're in the 2D domain and then you cross into the 1D domain and then cross back into the 2D domain, there's some assumptions that have to be made. And so you can get a little bit less accurate um, in answer. Uh, some of the ways around that would be to use uh, the 2D conduits. Uh, you could also use uh, 2D linear drainage. So this would be like a driveway uh, drain or something like that that's, that's slotted. Uh, the other things that you can put in here are bridge linear structures uh, and, um, oh gosh, what's the other one? There's two components, bridge linear structures um, and, gosh, I can't think of the other one. Tim, do you know? Bridge linear structures. Oh, this is going to kill me. Um, I'll look it up and find it. Um, uh, the other option in here, being able to link the 1D and 2D calculations at minor time steps can also help with uh, instabilities between the two. Uh, 2D hydraulics, uh, this is a big one, especially um, if you're more familiar with maybe modeling with XP or uh, two flow, um, just because of the 2D mesh in there is a fixed grid. So you don't have to you don't run into these issues as much uh, having small mesh elements. Uh, these are um, essentially if you have like a building file, uh, like in this case, uh, if you have two uh, vertices that are very, very close to each other, it can cause uh, the triangulation to uh, go through and uh, make really, really tiny elements. Uh, you can set up themes to be able to uh, look for these. Um, so you, I've got the theme here where uh, basically it's pointing out anything with a lower than um, lower than uh, five uh, feet uh, square feet uh, is uh, being pointed out. So you can quickly identify where those issues might be. Uh, the very very small mesh elements uh, are usually unnecessary uh, for being able to model uh, in the 2D uh, space and they can cause really, really long run times. Um, so there's another article there, tips for good meshing, uh, goes over some of this. Um, there's also clip meshing available, uh, which has some other things in it uh, to be able to um, uh, end up without uh, very, very, very small elements. Um, and I think before we move on to the next topic here, figure we tackle some of these questions. Yep, we are on the same page there, Ryan. Um, great questions coming in here. I'll start at the top and work our way down here. Uh, first one from Oscar. How do you uh, connect the new culvert type to the 2D model, the mesh? And how would you afo avoid flow restriction at the mesh uh, triangle where that would be connected? Um, I'm guessing this is for the new conduit culvert type. Um, I guess I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding exactly, but I think the answer is uh, being able to use mesh zones or mesh level zones and then just specifying the uh, elevation uh, for the different uh, inverts that you might have for that um, for that culvert. But I guess you can add more detail in if that didn't answer the question. Yeah. Um, uh, next question yeah. here, um, Shuin. Uh, what about the? You showed those diurnal patterns. I think mm -hmm. back in the dry weather flow. Um, the, does the average not have to equal to one? What happens to the dry weather flow calculation at each time step? 
Yeah, so the diurnal pattern is the same and it averages out to one um, over the course of the day. Um, what happens to the drive on the flow calculation under each time step? Um, it, it's just taking that factor during that time period. So let's say it's 0.5 at six o'clock in the morning. That 0.5 gets multiplied against the per capita flow per day of let's say 10. So now we've got five um, um, gallons per minute, I guess, um, or CFS, to, I don't know, I always go to CFS. Um, so that, that 0.5 gets multiplied against the per capita flow per day of 10. So now we're at five and then that, um, that flow during that time factor gets multiplied against the population in that uh, area. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, next question from John. Uh, if vertical pipes are difficult uh, to model, and I think this was back in a couple of slides ago, yeah. um, what is the best way to model a sanitary uh, lead with a riser? I would imagine using a uh, storage node would be better um, and just model it as a storage area. So you're not really modeling a pipe, it's, it's more of just the node. All manhole kind of thing. Okay. Uh, uh, is there a simple way to remove them or do we have to do it manually? I'm guessing this is in reference because it was about the same time as the small mesh elements in um, ICM. Uh, yes, you would have to remove them manually. If it's something that you've brought in that's interacting with the surface or acting interacting with the mesh, uh, then you would have to go and, and fix those things potentially outside of um, outside in, in like ArcGIS Pro or ArcMap uh, and then re-import that and then remesh the area. I guess you can um, delete out physically within ICM. That is another thing. Um, I know it was something that came up on another one because it is a little bit uh, cryptic to be able to add and remove uh, vertices. Um, so it's actually, I forgot which one it is, but if you hold down control and then click on an area, I think that's to add a, a vertice. And then likewise, if you hold uh, alt and click on a vertice, it'll delete the vertices. So a little bit of a, a trick to be able to modify objects within ICM. Uh, the other thing on that is if you don't want to go through and manually edit that, I would take a shot using uh, the clip meshing because um, that should uh, not cause those those tiny elements just because of the methodology that gets used uh, with it. Yeah, I know that tool's definitely been helpful to, to minimize the amount of work there using that clip meshing. Uh, a comment here from Dan before last question. Uh, comment from Dan uh, on that diurnal pattern one. I believe the average of the diurnal pattern does not need to be exactly equal to one for weekend daily volumes that are often larger. I have a diurnal curve that goes up to more than one for that factor. So just again, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, color there. Right. And then one question here from Travis. Uh, I, I know one limitation of 2D land use in ICM is that you can't assign a variable roughness. We use this feature a lot in rain on grid models in XP, XP swim. Um, to better represent yeah. buildings. Are there any plans to add this feature to ICM? Yeah, so it is in swim networks. Um, if you if you model a swim network, there is a variable roughness for the depth. It's not an ICM as far as I know. Uh, there aren't really any plans to incorporate it, uh, but I think it's I think it's up to two or three different um variable roughnesses can be put in for swim networks within ICM. Mm -hmm. And there's, yeah, that's perfect. Um, definitely seeing a lot of ways you can do buildings there pretty easily. Um, and there, there was one other question that I just went ahead and answered in the chat from David. Uh, can you recommend a source of, or glossary of terms and very basics of these topics? Uh, for sure, there's, there is the Infox ICM help file that is available online. It'll be going through kind of a, um, a bit of a, revamp is my understanding in the, this next year or so. So look for that to improve even more than what's already there, which is a very rich help file. It's just really the format will be changing, I think, quite a bit, uh, make it easier to access. Um, but it's still very searchable and very helpful there. And there are a good number of 
uh, ICM Basics YouTube playlist out there. Uh, again, you can see the, the links that I've added to the chat if you look for David's um, question there, but do check those out. We do have a full Autodesk Innovise YouTube page. I'm sure everyone's very excited to subscribe to, especially with the, the new short form content coming out soon. Um, yeah, and just real quick, another question comment that, that came in before we move on, but uh, someone's suggesting that they uh, look into simplifying polygons in GIS to remove uh, vertices and simplify the polygons, and it fixes some of those small elements. So uh, that sounds like it's another good option for uh, being able to modify the um, modify those buildings or roadways or whatever you're trying to bring in. I don't know that there's necessarily another or a better method than that, um, other than the you know what we've kind of discussed so far with some of the clip meshing options. Yeah, well, and we can share again that just the slide earlier, we had that article that's on the support community portal for yeah. tips on good clip meshing. So yeah, and um, yeah, and that that doesn't include clip meshing because it was written prior to when that development was put in. But um, I'll put really, that yeah link in the chat here. Uh, so I guess just moving on to uh, some things. I wasn't really sure where exactly to put this. This isn't really a troubleshooting thing, but something that kind of comes up and something that I wasn't really aware of until uh, relatively recently. But we do have this print layout. This is for uh, being able to put together uh, reports uh, in more of just a uh, kind of booklet type of format. Um, seems pretty useful. Uh, for folks trying to get deliverables out, being able to put uh, plan views and long sections and keys and legends and um, north arrows, uh, different things like that, uh, being able to put a report together. Um, so two really good knowledge base articles. Um, I don't, uh, some of the stuff I've gone over in the, the previous best practices and then also uh, some of these other things uh, that I'll be talking about here. These are behind our support portal. Um, so if you don't have an account, it might be hard to get to, uh, but in large part what I'm going over is contained within these uh, two articles right here. Uh, the first one being on initialization and issues that you could run into uh, with initializations and kind of how to, how to solve it. So I've got a, um, a model right here that is uh, initializing and it's been initializing for almost a thousand minutes. Um, this one, honestly, I forgot that I was running it and I was trying to come up with an example. Uh, but if it's if it's running, if it's trying to initialize more than, I don't know, really like a couple of minutes, um, likely there's something wrong with the, the model and, and you should uh, look into it deeper um, before just letting it continually run into initialization. So um, in the job pro progress window, there is this little button at the top here that is to stop the initialization. So you can actually force the model uh, to run and stop initializing. So once you hit that button, um, it will try to run the model. Uh, typically, the model is going to crash pretty quickly. Uh, and with that, you can get some results from it. So you can see here, this one's crashed. And I've got... Um, and it's just that it crashed immediately. Um, so what I did here uh, was look up the flood volume. So there's a, a large number of nodes that have um, uh, a good bit. And so this number can be, these numbers can be positive or negative, but just looking for where uh, the most volume has been uh, lost or gained in the system. Um, all of those nodes uh, seem to point to um, we're, we're all upstream of this, uh, these two pumps here. Uh, so I've got a storage node where all the, all that, all that system where I was having a lot of those negative flooding values, all entering into this storage node and then, uh, being pumped out through these pipes. Uh, the issue with this one was, uh, that this model came in, uh, with these, this link modeled as a force main solution. And if, uh, that model in, um, in order to do that, the best practice is to uh, modify these uh, to to a break node um, instead of uh, keeping them as manholes uh, in order to use that force main uh, solution. Um, and just pointing out that, you know, looking for those uh, large volume types can be helpful. Uh, 
um, simulation trouble. Um, this is another one that I feel like is a little bit cryptic to get to, uh, but you can right click on any simulation and you can open as you can uh, pull up the the log results. You can also pull up the PRN summary results, which are uh, a little more at the um, um, at the like each node and things like that. If you open up as the log results, though, uh, and if you did have a simulation that failed, uh, you will get a uh, message uh, at the very bottom of the log file saying that it failed and that the um, and, and saying where the convergence uh, last uh, failed. Um, and so that can give you an idea of you know where to start looking in the model. It might not necessarily be at that link uh, or the node, but uh, maybe in an area close by, something just that's that's kind of going wrong with things. Um, so then you can also uh, turn on here the uh, what is it um, in the diagnostics? Uh, you can turn on um, some information here, the time step log. Uh, this will actually uh, this will greatly increase the, uh, the results file, uh, but it can give you an idea of uh, where exactly things are are starting to fail. So instead of just the last one that failed, like in that um, in that log file, uh, you can actually get a time step log, and then you can get an idea of um, where things are starting to fail. So um, that's not what I wanted. Um, so it'll go through each time step and tell you which one's not converging. And, and generally, you can kind of line it up uh, where um, issues are. So it'll give you this um, summary here as well and the number of times that the uh, link um, has failed at the uh, um, in the area. So, um, so again, not necessarily that one that fails at the very end, but the one that fails the most would be uh, another good place to look. Um, yeah, volume balance error. Um, you know, I, I had a hard time trying to find a, a good example of this, but anytime you have the volume balance error, um, you know, it's something that's, you know, even five, 10 percent or something like that, uh, that can indicate uh, some issues. And then, of course, the always uh, flow oscillations and just rapidly changing flow within a link um, is also a uh, cause for issue. Um, simulation failure in 1D, 2D models. Um, in the uh, log information, uh, you can look for the volume um, volume balance here. Uh, so I would advise checking the volume balance error in the 2D summary log. Uh, this should be pretty close to zero, uh, where anything less than five is usually acceptable. Uh, if it's greater than five, then um, there there could be some issues and some mass error. Um, and in most cases, when it is above five, um, it tends to be with the uh, areas that it's interfacing 1D and 2D areas. And with that, that was pretty good timing. Yeah, perfect. And if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to add them to the chat there. And um, you know, also follow up with Ryan or I directly with our emails there on the screen. Uh, a couple of questions came in, though, Ryan, um, yeah. from uh, Lorian. Uh, did the ability to add in in depth intensity data manually get added to the updated version? I know you mentioned some additional rainfall data being added, but is there any manual input options? Uh, yes, there's always been. Um... I guess I can. I guess is this going back to the the NOAA stuff you were mentioning? Yeah, um, and I mean, hopefully, I'm getting this right. But if you go and create a rainfall event, just untick the generated rainfall design. If I hit OK, and then I open up the profile here, um, uh, I need to. So you can add another storm uh, here, and then this is in inches per hour. Uh, and then you can also add more profiles and then um, just copy and paste data into here. I don't know why that's grayed out. Shouldn't be grayed out. 
anyway, I was going to go in there because I can modify um, some of the things in there. Yeah, apparently this question kind of comes from uh, an earlier discussion you had with uh, Rebecca, maybe an email, but uh, they'll send you an email to update you on that previous conversation. It sounds like you had a year. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do remember that where Houston has some specific Noah stuff. Um, yeah, that hasn't been. <laughs> yes. Sounds like yeah. you got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that hasn't been been modified um or changed um when will icm be compatible with gis pro uh good question soon um <laughs> so it's kind of part of the reason of putting that safe harbor statement in um i can't give like a specific timeline or anything like that but at, at least this year um yeah I, I think maybe during the next release, but I'm I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure, but it should be soon. Well, it always depends on what folks mean by that, you know, compatibility with ArcGIS Pro. I yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would imagine. I, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there are certainly a number of workflows. I was just going to say where you can still obviously interchange uh, data. And that's obviously usually the biggest thing for folks. If you're using G, uh, ArcGIS Pro, you likely still have access to Arc map if you want to still use those map controls in in forks icm you're still able to do some of that so um yeah more um uh, compatibility coming is what's on the roadmap and what's planned for sure yeah um python along with uh ruby and icm um no i don't think there are any plans for that but uh it's certainly something that's that's come up from a variety of our users so um yeah, <laughs> I I, it, I think the the whole thinking was when they were originally trying to decide a language, they just chose the wrong one, basically. Oh, well, I mean, not the wrong yeah. one, but <laughs> one that became became less less prolifically used. Yeah. I think we have GIS to think for that. Yeah, yeah, Eric, I think you're probably familiar with the GitHub site and the you know, Ruby resources we have there, but we do have a GitHub site for folks wanting to get into that automated data exchange with uh, Ruby scripting. Um, we do have a number of support resources for that. I can maybe add that to the chat. Hopefully everyone's seeing the chat uh, come up because I also added the links to the clip meshing, the initialization and the troubleshooting of hydraulic models in Inforks ICM. I added those links in here. Um, Oh, yes, we do have a GitHub site that helps with a lot of that Ruby scripting. Uh, then we have a question about showing more water points along a conduit without breaking it into shorter lengths. Um, so I guess this isn't really your, answering your question, but uh, you do have this option to modify the computational nodes. This isn't necessarily going to show you different water elevations, but it's actually computating. Uh, computing the the um, flow at various points through the the network. The other thing that you could do is uh, network uh, results point one D um, and use those on there. Uh, so let's just name it something, um, and then that's going to be associated with the uh, with the link there. So you can see with the the link and distance from the upstream, um, it's going to give you the results along there uh, just with that point. So um, I think we had a question about the recording. Yes, this mm -hmm. is recorded and we're, um, it'll be published to the website at some point within the next couple of days. Um, and with that, uh, I feel like we've got pretty good timing. Anything you want to wrap up with him uh yeah feel free to again add a question if you do have one um hanging out there um we still have a bit of time here but um yeah again we'll be looking to bring you know more of similar content ryan's uh presented i almost feel like every slide you presented ryan 
um, could be broken into its own kind of you know new video, new feature in in Works ICM. <laughs> well, I was, uh, I was there thinking was so that much with good stuff in there. Yeah. I was thinking about that with the CAD thing, just using that video. <laughs> mm -hmm. that out, yeah. But... Yeah, so stay tuned for that for, for folks out there. Or again, if you the survey at the end, if you do have questions or workflows that you, you you're curious about and any of the Innovise solution, um, you know, we'll definitely be looking at that as we're always looking at your feedback and putting that into again more kind of short form uh, content as well here. So um, yeah, appreciate uh, everybody taking the time today, and we'll definitely get the recording out. Um, and right. yeah, have a great uh, rest of your day here, everybody. See Thanks, you. Ryan. Yep. Bye.